Buonasera a tutte e tutti, grazie per partecipare al nostro evento su Oliver Twist. E questa sera parleremo di Oliver Twist, uh, Social Criticism and Race Issues, on page and on screen. Uh, ce ne parla il professor Arturo Cattaneo, che mentre appare saluto, che presento brevemente anche se credo che molti di voi ormai siano dei fedeli dei nostri appuntamenti e vi ringrazio, ci fa molto piacere perché siete sempre tanti e interessati. Il professor Cattaneo è eh, docente di letteratura inglese all'Università Cattolica e tra i tanti ruoli che ricopre, oltre al, eh, al fatto che passa molto tempo per, a scrivere per noi, lo ringraziamo moltissimo, è autore della nostra ultima letteratura eh, Literary Journeys, eh, si occupa anche di un eh, Center for Travel Culture and Narration e quindi è direttore del CENDI, sempre eh, legate, eh, legato alle iniziative dell'Università. Eh, prima di lasciargli la parola, eh, ripeto brevemente alcune informazioni di massima che vi possono essere utili, potete fare domande, per inserire le vostre domande potete collegarvi alla pagina tuadomanda.it e indicare il codice di questo evento che è 1600-1600. Uh, se vi è più comodo potete farlo anche utilizzando il QR code che comparirà di tanto in tanto in sovrimpressione uh, e quindi potete appunto formulare le vostre domande alla fine dell'intervento del professor Cattaneo le raccogliamo e gliele proponiamo. Uh, L'attestato di partecipazione per chi è iscritto all'evento sarà disponibile nei prossimi giorni sul sito mondadorieducation.it alla pagina attestati dove troverete anche le slide utilizzate dal professore in questa diretta. Uh, per chi accedesse allo streaming in differita, l'attestato sarà disponibile solo uh, se si sarà effettuato l'accesso dalla mail di conferma di iscrizione entro la mezzanotte di oggi, mentre invece la registrazione del video resterà disponibile sul nostro canale YouTube allo stesso indirizzo al quale lo state vedendo in questo momento. Uh, credo appunto di avervi riempito di tutte le informazioni necessarie, passo molto volentieri la parola al professor Cattaneo, uh, che ringrazio per essere qui anche questa sera. Grazie. Grazie Laura. E beh, è un piacere essere qui ancora, ancora dico perché insomma l'anno scorso e anche due anni fa ci siamo visti con, eh, sicuramente con, con alcuni di voi, se non con molti di voi. Uh, it's a real pleasure, as the English say, and also because we will talk to, today uh, of a very famous book, uh, one, which is one of the best love book uh, in, the, in English literature. Uh, by the best loved novelist in English literature, Charles Dickens. And when the, start, when the slides you know, come in, uh, which should be right now, good, um, we're going to begin. Uh, there's one thing. Oh, here we are, sorry. Right, uh, this is our title, Oliver Twist, Social Criticism and Race Issues on Page and on Screen. Um, something which is quite, um, well, not a surprise, really, social criticism, as far as Dickens is concerned. Maybe race issues uh, is slightly less well known, um, but we're going to say a few words about that on page and on screen. That's quite interesting. Now, we begin what with? With books. You know, this, I don't know about you, but uh, I find it very, uh, very rewarding, you know, when I start in you know, my classes, you know, by showing students Uh, literally the books physically, the books that we're going to talk about. I did this this morning in, with 1984, and it's always something that, you know, creates a link between uh, teacher and audience and students, you know, the links and the books. And these are the, the books, Oliver Twist in three volumes, that it came out in, six, in 1838, and uh, uh, Pickwick Papers, always by Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, obviously. Uh, it is well known fact that the three books, together with sketches by Boz, these are Dickens's first three uh, books or works, um, came out in installments. And the interesting thing is to see how they overlapped. You know, while Dickens was writing and publishing sketches by Boz, he also began to write and publish Pickwick papers. Uh, same with Oliver Twist, you know, while he was writing and publishing Pickwick Papers, he was writing and coming out with Oliver Twist. Uh, so we're talking about the period in February 1837, April 1839. 
Um, this is what we're talking about, sketches by Boss at the beginning. Uh, this is the book uh, Dickens made himself known by. Uh, of course, Bose was a pseudonym or a pen name, uh, but it was no secret that the book had been written by, well, was written by, by Charles Dickens, even in his own time. Now, the one thing I want to begin with and share with you is the contents of sketches by Bose. Why? Because the contents of sketches by Bose, Dickens's first work, tell us his keen interest in social issues. In real life, first of all, look at that, our parish, the beadle, the schoolmaster, the curate, the old lady, these are all characters. Uh, the Brooksman, our next door neighbor, uh, and especially his concern for scenes not just of everyday life, uh, but also with the so-called underworld, and even the criminal world. Uh, we can see it here. We have on the second row, second line, Scotland Yard. Uh, we have something like uh, last lines, a visit to criminal courts, and very last line, criminal courts, and a visit to Newgate, well, Newgate being the notorious, famous or notorious uh, London prison. So from the very beginning, uh, Dickens was very much interested in things related to low life, the underworld, the criminal world, and of course, social issues. Now, Sketches by Boss was a great success, as we know. And after that, Dickens was asked to publish something uh, to furnish, in fact, uh, a series of comic uh, stories uh, connecting with illustrator Robert Seymour and to bind them together into a novel. And as it happened, uh, the book became Britain's real first publishing phenomenon. Bootleg copies, theatrical performances, joke books coming from the, from the book, from Pickwick paper, and even merchandising. The success of the Pickwick papers popularized serialized fiction and cliffhanger ending. That became famous quite recently, and uh, due to television, but of course Dickens was one of the uh, one of the inventors of the of cliffhanger endings. And we see here the cover of Pickwick Club, uh, followed by a few illustration, few illustrations, um, the gatherings of the or the meetings of the Pickwick Club, uh, Mr. Pickwick. When we move to Oliver Twist, this is the frontispiece of. Uh, the first edition, Oliver Twist of the Parish Boys Progress, again by Boz, so famous he was uh, by then. Uh, we see on the left side uh, one of the famous illustrations by George Cruikshank. And these illustrations were just as famous as Dickens's pages. In fact, the two go together. It's really hard to separate them. They tell us something quite interesting. Uh, we tend to think, inevitably so, of books today um, as printed books, as separated from images. Uh, but in Dickens's time, and in the Victorian age at large, or even in the 18th century, for a long time, uh, books, novels, often came with illustrations. And the illustrations were part and parcel of the whole story. Um, something which has to do with what we're going to say later the film, some film versions of Oliver Twist. And when it comes to illustrations, uh, the illustrations of Oliver Twist are a far cry, quite different from those of Pickwick Papers. Why? Because Pickwick Paper was about English provincial life. It was a comic book. Uh, whereas Oliver Twist, despite his comic quality, uh, was very much about real serious social problems. In fact, in here we see the illustration uh, of Oliver being shot at and hurt during the attempted burglary at the house, at the Mr. Brownlow's house, or the Maley's house, sorry. Uh, here we see another dramatic scene towards the end of the novel, and this is Bill Sykes trying to escape. Uh, by lowering himself from a chimney, from a roof, 
down into a channel. Um, and as we know, he falls down and kills himself. He's killed by the fall. Together with his dog, by the way, uh, his faithful dog, Bullseye, uh, which we see on the right side on top of the roof. Uh, so this shows that Oliver Twist Dickens, uh, Oliver Twist, sorry, Oliver Twist is quite another matter. We have very serious scenes, mostly dealing with the criminal world, the underworld. And we also have this, another famous illustration. This is Oliver Twist on the right, um, coming to know his new friends, so to speak, uh, the criminal gang gathered by Fagin on the left side, the pawnbroker and the head of the gang of children to which Oliver for, for a time reluctantly belongs. Uh, and that's the core of the story as we know. Uh, look at the way Fagin is dressed. He is quite different from the other characters. And we can see it even here, uh, Fagin in prison, in the prison house in Newgate, uh, at the very end of the novel. He's waiting to be sentenced. And again, he's dressed and the way he looks is quite different. Why? Because George Cruikshank, uh, the illustrator, uh, wanted him to look different because of his, of he being a Jew. And we come here to the point by way of illustrations, uh, which we'll see in a short while. But before we tackle that, uh, let's consider the three words or areas of Oliver Twist. Uh, first one is that of the parish workhouse, simply the workhouse. Uh, where poor people were gathered, and orphans too, like Oliver Twist. Um, second part is the word of London's criminals. The third part is the word of the wealthy upper middle class. Uh, they usually take up different separate sections of the, of the novel, uh, and they do come together quite clearly uh, at the end of the novel, you know, when the, all the threads are brought together. Uh, third conclusion brings all characters and themes together, chapters 49 to 53. Now, <clears throat> it's well known that Dickens was much better at depicting low life and the life of ordinary people, even of criminals, as compared to the life of the, the wealthy upper middle class. Uh, he wasn't so much at ease with that. Uh, his depiction of upper middle class people tended to be stereotype, um, whereas his depiction of low class people was much closer to reality. This is the movement uh, which centers around Oliver Twist. He is born nearly or taken to the workout, workout as an orphan, so very young. Uh, from that he runs away. Why does he run away? We're going to say that and see that in a short while. Uh, he runs away because he's in danger. Um, his life is literally in danger. It's not just that he's not at home in the house he's working at, at as an apprentice. It's not just that he's being bullied by the older boy in the house. His life is really in danger. But as it happens on the road, Oliver meets someone, a young uh, boy like him, who takes him to Fagin's, Fagin, that's the name of the boss of the juvenile gang, uh, in London. And there we enter London's criminal world. And from now on, the rest of the novel, as we know, will be a tug of war uh, between the genteel world, the upper wealthy, uh, upper class, the wealthy people who want to get Oliver, they will get him in the end and save him and the criminal world. And here again, Oliver risks his life. He could be dead now as well. So this is a comic story in many places, but it's really about a young boy, an orphan, who risks his life all throughout the novel. And why? Because of the social conditions of the time. 
Now, we know that in departing from the matter word of Pickett, Dickens targeted the Poor Love Amendment Act of 1834, uh, which dealt with the workhouses that were meant to be a sort of relief for the poor. As it happened, they were an institution uh, in which the poor were exploited, in which young children, orphans, were exploited, and badly so. They were badly fed, badly clothed. Uh, they could hardly survive. And that's one way uh, Oliver Twist could have ended his life quite young. They were starved to death, literally. And in that uh, illustration we saw on the frontispiece of Oliver Twist, remember, we saw it's the most famous illustration of Oliver Twist, and that was Oliver asking for more. Um, he was talking on, he's talking there on behalf of the other children. What are they taking? What are they saying, asking for? They're asking for more. What more? More food. They're simply starving. And some of them actually died in the workhouses because of malnutrition and maltreatment. Same with the so-called ragged schools of London, uh, which were a disgrace, literally. There were schools, apparently, uh, and the very term ragged in rags. Children were in rags. And Dickens visited them, uh, one of them in special, uh, in 1843, and that inspired him to write a Christmas Carol. He was appalled, literally, at what he's frightened at what he saw at Field Lane, and he wanted to write a pamphlet on that, but he being what he was, you know, a great writer, he decided uh, to write a story, uh, which was fortunate. Uh, this is a picture, contemporary picture of a ragged school, uh, and children are really ragged. Most of them are barefooted, which was quite, quite common at that time. Now, I want us to focus for a while uh, on chapter three of Oliver Twist. Why? Because here again, Oliver Twist risks his life. He could be dead now. Uh, because this is the chapter, very early in the story, chapter three, in which he is going to be uh, apprenticed to a chimney sweeper. He would become a chimney sweeper. And here we see the board of directors of the workhouse, so the important people in the workhouse, talking to Mr. Gamfield, uh, the sweeper who wanted an apprentice, and he wanted it for next to nothing. He would just pay some money to the workhouse. Look at what's said here. It's a nasty trade, said Mr. Limkins, uh, one of the board of directors. Uh, and another gentleman asked, Young boys have been smothered in chimneys before now. Smothered, suffocated, dead, because of suffocating in chimneys. And see, well, look at what the uh, Mr. Gamfield uh, says, how he replies. Uh, of course, in, in Cockney, uh, that's because they dumped the straw for they lit it in the chimney to make them come down again. That's all smoke and no place. Whereas smoke ain't no use at all in making a boy calm down, for it only sends him to sleep, and that's what he likes. And the next sentence is really frightening. Boy is very obstinate and very lazy, gentlemen. And there's nothing like a good hot blaze, fire, to make them calm down with a run. It's humane to gentlemen, because even if they're stuck in the chimney, roasting their feet make them struggle to extricate themselves. Well, what to say of that? Um, it's simply that Oliver fortunately escapes uh, because when he's taken to the magistrate, who was supposed to, the, to sign the indenture, so the document, legal document, by which he would have been given um, to the man, to Gamfield, as uh, a chimney sweeping. Um, when he's asked, I suppose he's fond of chimney sweeping, uh, he says, he looks paid and alarmed, as we can say here, in bold, in bold letters. And look at the last uh, sentence, Oliver fell on his knees and clasping his hands together, prayed that they would order him, order him back to the dark room, that they would starve him, beat him, kill him if they pleased, which is what 
would happen to him in the possibly happen to him in the workhouse rather than send him away with that dreadful man and i was going to say that uh this might seem uh well to our to our children you know to our uh, to the the students in our classes there might seem exaggeration uh something nearly comical even though terrible written by dickens but we know that small boys were actually sought out by sweeps uh, because they were small enough to be lowered into chimneys to brush away the soot. And they it were in fact sold to slavery. Uh, they didn't get any money. Uh, they hardly well, they were hardly fed because the thinner uh, they were, the better they could go down chimneys much better. And the age of these boys was really frightening. Oliver is nine years old at that time, at the time, uh, this time in the novel. Uh, most uh, sweep, chimney sweepers were six years of age, but even boys as uh, young as four were used. And tales of boys getting stuck in the flues and suffocating or burning to death were common. And this practice was finally abolished in 1875 to keep down costs to the parish. Uh, images are even more shocking. These are two chimney sweepers, uh, totally blackened, you know, by living most of the time among the suit of the chimneys. Uh, this is a very, or very young chimney sweeper. How old is that boy? Three, four, five, four, five, maybe, I don't know, six. But it's frightening, it's going to be lower down into the chimney. And this is a contemporary drawing. Uh, um, I don't know whether we, you can read, uh, but the caption at the bottom reads, the death of two climbing boys in the flue of a chimney, frontispiece to England's climbing boys by Dr. George Phillips. And we can see on the left, a young boy, a young chimney sweeper, dead, already dead, lying on the floor. And we can see another boy being extracted, literally taken out of the flue of the, well, the chimney, and he'll be dead as well. Now, of course, the, the famous poem by, by Blake comes to mind, the chimney sweeper, and this would go, the two would go together very well. Uh, or very dramatically, unfortunately. Now, let's go back to the criminal word, uh, because that takes us back to Fagin, and Fagin takes us to the theme of Jewishness, which is one of the, the race issues uh, at the center of our talk today. Now, the criminal word is mostly made up of a few characters, Fagin, the boss, and his gang of young thieves, unforgettable characters, Fagin in the first place, by the artful dodger Charlie Bates. And Nancy, there's a girl who's a prostitute and she's Sykes' woman, Bill Sykes' woman. In the end, she'll be the one who saves Oliver. We have, as we said, Bill Sykes with his dog Bullseye, uh, a very hardened criminal. He has no pity for anyone. Uh, he tries to kill Oliver at one point and he does murder. Nancy, his woman, the prostitute he is exploiting, uh, he brutally murders her. Why? Because she has helped Oliver and she has been found out. Then, of course, uh, then we have another uh, criminal, but that's a high class criminal. That's a dark villain or a Byronic hero called Monks. His real name is Edward Leeford and he is Oliver's half brother. Now, the interesting thing for us is that the slang terms used by the Atul Dodger and the others uh, in the gang uh, were term termed flash language by former British convict James Hardy Bucks, Bucks uh, who compiled a list of such terms in his vocabulary of the flash language in 1812, which means uh, that Dickens wrote uh, with first-hand knowledge of the underground and of the language used by criminals. And this brings us to one of our main points today. Oliver's twist was well received, but 
not with the adulation of Pickwick. Why? Uh, one of the reasons was that Dickens was severely criticized for introducing criminals and prostitutes in Oliver Twist, to which he replied, uh, so many were the accusation, it was a repeated accusation uh, brought against the book. Uh, in the preface to the library edition of Oliver Twist in 1858, uh, this is Dickens, I saw no reason when I wrote this book why the very dregs of life, so long as their speech did not offend the ear, should not serve the purpose of the moral. And he was even more explicit in other parts of that, <clears throat> sorry, introduction. And he says that, um, it appeared to me that to draw a knot of such associates in crime as really did exist, to paint them in all their deformity, in all their wretchedness, in all this squalid misery of their lives, would be to attempt something which was needed and which be a service to society. Why? Because before criminals were romantic figures, like in Walter Scott or Lord Byron's poems and novels. Um, they were romantic figures. Uh, they did not correspond to real life. Uh, where were, in their works, in those works, the cold, wet, shirtless, midnight streets of London, the foul and frozy dens, where vice is closely packed, the haunts of hunger and disease, the shabby rags, these are all things which are in Oliver Twist. And he defends his portrayal of Nancy, the prostitute, for which uh, he was very much attacked. And he says here, he writes here, uh, the stern truth is that was a part of the purpose of this book. I did not abate lower one hole in the Dodger's coat or one scrap of curl paper in Nancy's disheveled hair. And he says, people complained that Nancy was too much devoted, in fact, you know, she was sort of slave to her man, Bill Sykes. Uh, and he says, I'm not sure whether this happens or not, but it's true. I mean, I've seen that, sorry. Uh, it is useless, this is different, to discuss whether the conduct and character of the girl seems natural or unnatural, right or wrong. It's not a matter of right, right or wrong, says Dickens. It's a matter of being true to the poor conditions, the terrible conditions of some people, including the poor girl in the story, Nancy, the prostitute, uh, who, since she was a child, had been exploited by men, especially by Bill Sykes. <coughs> now, it's quite interesting to realize, to know, that objection to the crudity of some scenes and you know, and uh, attitudes in Oliver Twist came not just in his own time, but even as late in, as uh, 1962, when a BBC TV adaptation of Oliver Twist came out, 13 episodes. And especially because the transmission happened at Sunday tea times, uh, the production pro proved to be controversial. And questions were asked in Parliament and many people complain over the brutal murder of Nancy by Bill Sykes, Nancy the prostitute by Bill Sykes in the 11th episode. Which takes us one more step in our discourse today, in our talk today. What we see on, on, on screen is often stronger than what we read. Why? Because what we see on screen usually has a reality which uh, the written page sometimes lack. Of course, there are terrible things which are written and which shock us. Uh, but the one thing is that when we mention something, something on paper, uh, we can be general. Uh, when we show it on screen, it has to be concrete, real. Uh, well, there's a famous... <clears throat> instance told by Umberto Eco, uh, he says, when I write a car is passing by, 
<clears throat> the reader can imagine any car passing by. Uh, the reader doesn't even need to know what car is it. Perhaps you know, doesn't even ask themselves what car is that. But if I shoot a film, um, a car that passes by has to be a real car, has to be a Volkswagen, has to be a Porsche or whatever. Uh, we cannot be general. And here we come to the race issue. Uh, the boss, the head of the gang of young criminals, the juvenile gang, in the book, in the story, in the novels we know, is Fagin, the merry old gentleman. Now he's a Jew. And it's surprising to find out, uh, actually, I, I myself didn't know it, didn't, didn't notice that. Uh, when I was studying, you know, in, in my time as a student, Oliver Twist, uh, people didn't talk about these things usually. Uh, but in the first 38 chapters of Oliver Twist, Fagin 274 times is referred to as the Jew. And Dickens expressed surprise when the Jewish community complained about the stereotypical depiction of Fagin. He halted, stopped the printing of Oliver Twist and changed the text for the part that had not been set to type yet. As a result, in chapters 39 to 53, in the 179 references to him, Fagin is hardly ever called the Jew. When editing Oliver Twist for the Charles Dickens edition of his works, Dickens eliminated most references to Fagin as the Jew. Why? Because as we said, as we can read here, uh, Many people, many readers had objected to that. But let's be more specific. This is something which I've done for today, uh, just, just as an example. In chapter 26 of Oliver Twist, Fagin is referred to 69 times, twice as old man, <coughs> 19 as Fagin, but often in direct speech when people call him by name and in that case, it's quite natural that people say Fagin, uh, but 48 times as a Jew. And look at this. Uh, this is a part from chapter 28. I hope you can read it. It's a bit packed, isn't it? I'm sorry. Uh, but anyway, in black, uh, we see the time, the two times, in fact, uh, in which Fagin is called Fagin, and one of them is in direct speech. What can I do for you, Mr. Fagin? All the other times, one, two, three, four, five, six, is called the Jew. Especially the narrator calls him the Jew repeatedly. And that goes on throughout the novel uh, until Dickens decides to stop things. Why? Because many complaints. Uh, typical one, uh, some years later, even as late as 1854, the Jewish Chronicle asked why Jews alone should be excluded from the sympathizing heart of this great author and powerful friend of the oppressed, because that's exactly the point. Dickens was very well, well, very well known and appreciated love uh, because he was on the side of the poor, the oppressed. Uh, so this insistence on the stereotypical aspect of the, of the Jew, uh, Fagin, you know, seemed very strange. Um, Dickens commented that by calling Fagin a Jew, he had made no imputation against the Jewish faith. And he said in a letter, I have no feelings toward the Jews, but a friendly one. I always speak well of them, whether in public or private, and bear my testimony to their perfect good faith in such transactions as I have ever had with them. And it so happens that in our mutual friend, Dickens created Raya, a positive Jewish character. Now, <clears throat> so much for the, for the race issue on page, about which obviously we could say much more, but uh, we're running short of time. Um, when Oliver Twist becomes a film, things become even more complicated. Why? Because as we said before, the cinema, the film or the television has a realistic quality, uh, which is really, which can be hardly escaped. And 
one step between the uh, the written page and the screen is the theatricalization of the novel. In other words, most novels at that time, including Oliver Twist, uh, were brought to stage um, as plays. In fact, uh, Oliver Twist was appearing in 10 theaters in London uh, before serialization of the novel was even completing. Amazing, isn't it? And uh, Dickens himself, as he was very well known, was a, a great teller, a great actor, born actor, and a great teller of his own stories. And especially one of the uh, points he was especially good at, and for which he was very much acclaimed, uh, was his dramatic performance of the murder of Nancy in Oliver Twist. And moving on to, moving from the plays of the theatricalization of the novel to real films, uh, the Internet Movie Database lists nearly 25 film versions uh, of the novel, first one in 1906, a silent Oliver Twist, obviously. Now, we now turn not to the first, first, first of these film versions, but to the one by David Lean, by director David Lean, one of the great directors, very well known, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, um, Passage to India, uh, to indicate a few more, a few of his adaptations. Oliver Twist, 18, 1948. Um, in this poster, by the way, we see Oliver and Bill Sykes, the bad guy, the villain of the story. Uh, we do not see Fagin, but the most controversial thing about the about the film was that the portrayal of Fagin by that great English actor Alec Guinness, uh, though critically acclaimed, was also very much controversial. Why? Because of his makeup, the way he looked, which was considered anti-Semitic. Uh, because it was felt to be perpetuate Jewish racial stereotypes. Why? Because Guinness wore a very heavy makeup, including a large prosthetic nose, a large fake nose. Uh, that was supposed to make him look like the character as he appeared in George Cruikshank's illustration in the first edition of the novel, because that's where it all started from. Uh, remember, we saw two of the many illustrations by Cruikshank uh, relating to Fagin, and he was very much the stereotypical Jew there. So that's the starting point. It all, uh, it all start from that. The interesting thing is that at the start of the production, uh, director David Lean was advised not to go on with that stereotypical representation. The makeup was too heavy, in other words. Why? Because that might, that might cause offense. Uh, to specific racial group or religion. And this is Alec Guinness as Fagin in David Lean's Oliver Twist. This speaks more, much more than anything we might say. This speaks volumes, as the English say. Uh, this is uh, actor Alec Guinness, a great actor. Uh, and that's his Fagin. Uh, now, uh, director David Lean uh, said that he didn't want uh, the features of uh, Fagin uh, to be too different from those of George Cruikshank Fagin. And, well, that's an explanation, but of course that doesn't really eliminate the problem as it became clear soon. Because, <coughs> sorry again, the 1949 release of the film in Germany met with protests outside the cinema by Jewish objectors, quite naturally. And the mayor of Berlin was a signatory uh, to the petition which called for the withdrawal of the film. And look at the dates. Let's think of the dates. Uh, 1948 or 1949, when the film was released in Germany, there was only a few years after the, well, the tragedy and the horrors of the Holocaust had been revealed to the world at the Nuremberg trials. 
As a result of objection by the New York Board of Rabbis, the film was not released in the United States until 1951. And when he, and when he was released, uh, seven minutes were cut. And in those seven minutes, especially, uh, there were profiled shots uh, with that offensive appearance, offensive nose, in fact, and other parts of Guinness's performance. And the film was banned in Israel for anti-Semitism. Well, quite to be expected. It was banned in Egypt for portraying Fagin too sympathetically. And the, the full-length version of Lin's film became available only in 1970s, in the 1970s in the United States on DVD. Of course, the problem of showing Jews uh, on stage or on screen um, was a long one, long dating one. And um, I, I believe last year or two years ago, we said something about the representation of the Merchant of Venice on stage. Uh, this is one uh, that goes back uh, to 1792. Uh, and again, the Jew is quite clearly different from the other characters, the Venetians in the play. Uh, this is another representation, uh, 1908, by the great Shakespearean actor Herbert Bourbon Tree, Shylock, and again, he is quite different. This is the 1922 film, Oliver Twist, uh, Oliver Twist being interpreted by Jackie Coogan, held captive, and again, noted at the center we have Fagin, uh, in, uh, portrayed by that great actor, silent film actor Lon Chaney. Uh, and again, look how different he looks from the others, uh, his stereotype. Now, uh, not many people know that uh, a, a musical first and a musical film later uh, was taken from Oliver Twist. Uh, which changes the atmosphere, obviously, is usually more comic and much more lively, and it takes away, puts aside uh, the crudest part of the story. Uh, but here again, we have obviously the problem of the uh, interpretation of Fagin. This is Ron, Mo Ron Moody, Ronald Moody as Fagin in the musical film, 1968. Uh, which looks very much like George Cruikshank-Fagin, doesn't he? And Fagin was seen much more sympathetically here, apart from his portrayal, uh, physical appearance. Um, he is less of a criminal, and at the very he's got nothing to do with Nancy's murder, unlike in Dickens's novel. He's horrified when he finds out, when he finds out, <clears throat> and at the end, he does not die in the musical, and in the musical, he faces the possibility of beginning a new life. Uh, whereas in the film taken from the musical, he uh, very joyfully, so to speak, goes back to his criminal life. Uh, they start their racket again. But here, the uh, anti Semitic part of the story, or supposed anti Semitic part of the story, is now dwelt upon. And of course, we, of course, we cannot leave out Roman Polanski's film, Oliver Twist, uh, the one which is closer to us, in which, again, Fagin is portrayed in a way that closely resembles Ron Moody, Ron Moody, and Kingsley, <clears throat> the great English actor, Gandhi, we remember him basically from that, mainly from that, mostly from that. Uh, and his portrayal of Fagin is not much unlike uh, the portrayal of Fagin by Alec Guinness in uh, David Lynn's 1948 film version. You know, that's why I put them side by side. Um, on the other hand, the character of Fagin, apart from his physical appearance, uh, in Roman Polanski's film, is much more human. Uh, there are points in which he is very close to Oliver, who seems to be so, 
in which Oliver seems to feel affection for him. And the final scenes, one of the final scenes in which Oliver goes to the prison, uh, to Newgate, uh, the night before Fagin is going to be sentenced, are really touching, really moving. Uh, young Oliver, you know, tries to redeem Fagin, but it's too late. Um, so the, the boy cries for him. Um, so the film, you know, gives quite another portrait, uh, uh, psychological and narrative portrait of Fagin, uh, while being still close to the old tradition of portraying Fagin as a typical, or we must say, we must say, a stereotypical Jew. Uh, that born uh, in George Crookshank, first edition of Oliver Twist. Well, many more things we could say about that. Of course, this is a huge problem, race issues, social issues, uh, problems that are still with us today. Um, well, every time we tackle that in our classes, um, this is quite a strong point. Um, so quite an issue even today, unfortunately for for many reasons. Right, so many more things could be said about that, as I say, but I would call it a day um, and stop here, um, waiting for your questions if there are any, or for any other things you might want me to say. So thank you, thank you for listening. Eccoci qua Arturo, allora grazie mille, molto inspiring come alcuni dei nostri, dei nostri insegnanti che ci stanno seguendo scrivono nella loro chat, ci sono delle domande per te, allora partirei da, da, da chi prima ha scritto, eh, allora is there any connection in the stereo, uh, stereotypical image of Fagin and the one of Shylock, the Jew in the Merchant of Venice, because it seems that Dickens himself thought so. Mm -hmm. Well, very much so, you know, as I try to point it out, a bit too, a little bit too fast, I'm afraid, you know, we were running out of time. Uh, but as I showed, you know, in those two uh, slides, you know, the, the two stage uh, portraits of, um, of, of uh, Shylock, yes, of course, you know, uh, the tradition is a long dating one. And I'm afraid, you know, um, it's not complementary to, uh, to the Jews. Um, on the other hand, as we very well know, uh, in The Merchant of Venice, we had that uh, great dramatic uh, speech by Shylock, uh, has a Jew not eyes, have we not tongue, uh, are we not like you, uh, do not we respond, if you prick us, do we not suffer? Uh, so Shakespeare, as usual, is very complex, you know. He is very, uh, he gives in a, a very around picture of his, uh, of his Jew. Uh, but of course, you know, I'm afraid that the stereotype vision of the Jew was very much common uh, in literature. Yeah. And of course, you know, Shakespeare has got a lot to do with that. Not so much with the stereotype, but with the image. Grazie, yeah. Tua. Why Ben Kingsley's interpretation of Fagin did not raise any particular objection? Uh, sorry, where is that? Because I cannot see it. Uh, uh, sorry, so I don't why, uh, I'm, going, I'm going to read it to you again. Okay, okay sorry. Why yeah. Ben Kingsley's interpretation of Fagin did not raise any particular objection? Okay. Um, well, I believe, um, for a number of reasons, uh, of course, you know, I, I don't have a clear-cut answer, you know, I don't have the definite answer to that. Uh, but I've been thinking about that, uh, working on Shakespeare and, uh, uh, and the, at the cinema, uh, on Merchant of Venice, for instance, on um, Roman Polanski's film. Well, in the first place, in the uh, David Lynn's film, uh, came out in 1948, and as I said before, there was only four years uh, after the horrors of the Holocaust or the Nazi concent concentration camps you know, uh, were being uh, shown to the world. Um, so the shock was really uh, recent. Um, I'm not saying, of course, that uh, today we're not shocked by that, uh, but 50 years 
um, roughly more than 50 years, in fact, you know, nearly 60, uh, elapsed between David Lynn's film and Roman Polanski's film. And, and in those 60 years, uh, the danger uh, of stereotypical uh, description and treatment of Jews in literature and films has considerably uh, diminished, it's not altogether vanished as we, as we know, uh, but not so much from literature and films, I would say, as far as I know anyway. Uh, of course, these things happen in real life because, you know, uh, unfortunately, uh, but as far as literature or films are concerned, uh, there is less, <clears throat> less of a danger than we uh, take as stereotypical something. And something similar, you know, happened with another film, uh, which has got to do with the uh, with portrayal of Jewish people. And that's To Be or Not To Be by Ernst Lubitsch, uh, which came out in 1941. Uh, to Be or Not To Be is about you know, a troupe of uh, Polish actors, players, who perform uh, Shakespeare Hamlet, uh, but who are really acting for the um, uh, resistance uh, uh, as partisans, you know, against the Nazis in Poland uh, with the help of the British. And uh, that too, you know, we have um, the, uh, the Jewish character there in, 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 in the film, is not called a Jew uh, because at that time it was uh, it was thought to be dangerous, you know, to even to to mention that um, people thought that that might be uh, wrongly interpreted. Uh, now, and, and and the film was very much criticized, even though Lubitsch was a great director. The film was very much criticized. Why? Because it was a comedy, and people said at this point, you know. Uh, in Second World War, in the middle of Second World War, World War II, uh, we shouldn't uh, have a comedy about that. Uh, comedy that involves the Nazi and the Jews. Um, now, when Mel Brooks, some of us, well, might remember Mel Brooks. Uh, he was a very famous the director and actor in the 1980s and 90s, a comic one. When did the remake of To Be or Not To Be uh, in the 1990s or late 80s, uh, no one objected to that. Why? Because 50 years later, the danger was felt to be, um, well, less real. Um, so uh, to me, that's one explanation. Not the yeah. only one, maybe, I'm afraid, but one explanation. Okay. Uh, just a quick suggestion. What is the best cinematic version to show <clears throat> in a high school class? You. Uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not really sure, you know, and, and uh, what the best is. Uh, I would say that um, Roman Polanski's uh, 2005 version uh, is a very good one. I use that in classes. Uh, I used them last year, um, and it's a good one because it's very close to us. And uh, Ben Kingsley is a splendid, you know, wonderful fagin, and and it cuts out much of the, um, the irrelevant part of the story. By irrelevant part of the story, I'm saying something which is wrong. Let's not repeat it. But uh, uh, the upper middle class world, um, half of it is left out, uh, which makes for a much quicker film. And I believe our students you know, get a better uh, view of that. Um, on the other hand, uh, David Lynn's film, apart from the um, exaggeration and the anti-Semitic portrayal, stereotypical uh, portrayal of Fagin, as far as social concerns are concerned, uh, as far as social concerns go, um, is very good. Um, in showing, you know, the hard treatment of children in the workhouse, in showing how they were exploited, they were like slaves, in fact, you know, uh, that's very good. That's a very good one. And um, a nice experiment, if we have a good class, a nice experiment might be also uh, to show the, the, the musical, uh, which is something we're not quite used to, but it's very much in line with Dickens and Victorian um, novel writing. Uh, so stories that were 
took taken to the stage uh, and even made into musical, which did happen in Victorian times. So that's quite interesting too. Thank you. One more question. Uh, could you suggest other examples of racial issues in famous books or racist <coughs> rendering of famous literary characters? Um, well, of course, you know, uh, here again, you know, uh, Merchant of Venice and the um, and Shylock in Merchant of Venice come to mind in the first place. Uh, but also, you know, we, I believe last year or two years ago, you know, we talked about Othello and that's another case in point, um, quite, quite useful. Um, then there are other things, you know, if we wanted to, um, to compare a book, you know, with, uh, with a film, we have the musical Cabaret, uh, which is more famous now than the book uh, it's taken from, uh, which is Isherwood's um, trilogy on Berlin. And that takes place in Berlin of the 1930s, uh, before the Nazis come to power, and that's got to do again uh, with um, with the depiction, the portrayal of Jewish people um, mixing with Germans, mix, mixing with uh, English expatriates in Berlin. That's a modern story, quite a good one. Uh, Fortunate, uh, bearing in mind that we have to deal in classes, we have to deal now, mostly if not all totally with great with big names, you know, great writers. Uh, that's very interesting, but more difficult. Isherwood is more difficult, uh, not more difficult in itself, uh, but simply because we have no time. Uh, so if you have a very good class, that might be interesting. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, it's more difficult. Grazie mille, Arturo. We run out of time. C'erano ancora molte domande. E, insomma, il tema è molto... Il tema, il tema può veramente spaziare e diventare una cosa proprio gigantesca. Ah, eh, sì. Ti passo i ringraziamenti delle persone che, che appunto che hanno, che hanno partecipato e che noi a nostra volta ringraziamo dando loro appuntamento al nostro prossimo incontro. Grazie ancora Arturo, grazie a tutti grazie quanti. Grazie a te, grazie a voi. E mi spiace sempre non poter vedere fisicamente tutti, perché so però che sono in tanti. Ecco, Anche però perché sono tutti tanti, sì. Un saluto vero, insomma, a tutti, non solo virtuale. Buonasera. Grazie ancora. Alla prossima. Ciao, ciao.